Well, caves have always been tourist attractions. Let's go in and have a look. Some caves are certainly dramatic with stunning formations, stalactites and stalagmites, forms of speleothem, colloquially termed dripstones. Stalagmites grow very slowly, around a centimetre or two every hundred years. Speleothems like this precipitate in air. So this passage hasn't been water filled for ages. While this passage, now partly submerged, was once open to the air altogether. So we can track how the level of water in modern caves like this has varied over time. Reading cave deposits builds up a history of cave development and especially the position of the water table through time. In modern systems, speleothems can be dated radiometrically by short-lived uranium isotopes, back for around 100,000 years. But I'm more interested in identifying much older cave systems and using these to tell tectonic stories. I'm going to explore two or three ancient cave systems, a couple in the French Alps and then one in Italy. So a bit of a soggy day in Yorkshire for a cave. But caves, they're great places to visit, particularly on a wet day, but they also have importance for understanding geological and tectonic processes. So let's see what they look like in the geological record. So it's off to the French Alps, to a range of hills right on the very edge of the mountain belt. These hills bring to the surface Cretaceous limestones, a unit called the Ergonian. So we're gonna go and visit these limestones where they come down to the valley of the River Isère. So, we're down in the low country, right on the edge of the Alps. This is one of the frontal anticlines made of Lower Cretaceous Limestone, making those cliffs that plunge down towards the river. We're coming here not to really look at the limestones but what they host. So let's explore some outcrops around this little park area here. So these are the lower Cretaceous limestones that make the mountain coming down here. But this, this material, which is filling a significant fracture porosity in here, these are sandstones. And you can see fragments of the host limestone floating around in the sandstone that fills the fracture porosity. So we're looking at mega porosity in the bedrock limestones. These are cave fills.
but we need to think a little bit about the conditions under which this Peyo cave system developed. You can get caves formed in submarine situations like the blue holes of the Bahamas. But was this cave above water table? Well, to answer that question, we need to look for speleothem. That's um, carbonate deposits, dripstone, that coat the walls of caves. And that only happens when caves are open to air, so above water table. Well, I can look carefully down this fracture set and there's no real sign of dripstone here. But let's check out another locality. And that other locality is actually just around the corner. It's a bit of a smelly outcrop by these bins. But this smooth material, it's speleothem, dripstone, and it coats these shapes on the bedrock limestone. But the real giveaway in here is what's filling the gaps between the speleothem. And it's sandstone. These are Cretaceous sandstones filling the mega porosity of the cave. So this is a Cretaceous cave. So the really neat thing is, this Cretaceous cave is still a cave today and you can visit it as a tourist. How can we use these geological observations to tell tectonic stories? Well, these relationships track vertical movements. The Ogonian limestone was deposited as a submarine platform under shallow seawater. But then later in the Cretaceous, the platform was uplifted above sea level at a time actually when global sea levels were rising. The later cave system was submerged and filled with sand, either because of global sea level rise or more likely by continued and renewed tectonic subsidence. So the ancient cave systems tell us of vertical movements, tectonic action, and that was way before the Alps were formed. For our next example, we're staying in the Alps, but we're moving east and back in time. because the rocks that host our next cave system are Triassic in age. So I'm here in the High Alps sat in a world of dollar stones. They're Triassic carbonates, forming these big hillsides. But it's not all dollar stone here. There's something else that's encased within them, and it's this stuff. They're these laminated beige rocks. Now, you can see if we scout around that they are sort of invading into the dollar stones which are grey. It's a nice piece to look at just down here. So these platy laminated beige rocks, you can see they form a web, a network through the outcrop. They're filling 
a karstic or paleo karstic paleo fracture porosity the grey rocks are triassic the stuff the these beige laminites these are jurassic so this is jurassic paleo cast let's have a look at it in a bit more detail The blocks of grey Triassic rocks would have littered the floor of a cavern that was coated by red silty muds, just the sort of thing we find in some modern caves. But here the cavern is no more, long since completely collapsed, presumably by the weight of rocks on top, much later. It's the red mudstones encasing the breccia blocks that's the real giveaway here, that the cavern once existed. So where is the old land surface from which the water and the mud have come from? Well, it's not here. It's way, way, way up, over 200 metres higher before you end up coming out of the Triassic dollar stones. So this is a really deep, penetrating cave system. However, there's no sign of speleothem here. So we don't know where the water table was at the time of this cave formation. But it certainly filled up with water and silt in its later development. But we can certainly track the idea that these host dollar stones have been moved up a significant uh, distance above their original depositional elevation so that the paleocast can penetrate down. So we start with a thick pile of Triassic carbonates, here in orange, deposited in very shallow water. And these rocks are elevated, maybe by as much as a kilometre, actually maybe more. The shallow parts of these uplifted carbonates are eroded away, but caves penetrated deeper below the surface. Then the whole lot subsides. Younger rocks deposit on top, and eventually the cave caverns collapse. We can use the geology to uncover the history of vertical movements, again far older than the Alpine mountains of today. So, another example of using paleocast features to deduce vertical movements due to tectonics. For the final stop on our brief tour, it's off to northern Italy. Those hills in the distance are the Alpi Apuane. The white material isn't snow, it's marble, quarried for millennia to make the famous buildings of Tuscany, and perhaps your kitchen worktop or bathroom. This is the famous Carrara marble, and it holds a remarkable and underreported secret. The rocks are highly deformed now, and unlike our alpine examples, they're metamorphosed too, and both of those things happened during mountain building. Let's see if we can see through the veil of metamorphism. These marbles were once limestones of Jurassic age and they contain big blobs of beige rocks, beige marley laminites. And they're associated with breccias, just like we've just seen in our Alpine example. Although of course here they're deformed So the marble includes this paleocast. These are ancient cave fills. And actually, 
rather nicely folded. So, with a bit of detective work, you can find ancient cave systems that tell of vertical movements not related to the landscape within which they lie today. But to much older parts of their geological history. Evidence of vertical movements when the limestones that host these ancient caves were still on the edges of seas and oceans, the seas that preceded the Alpine mountains of today.